I want to say welcome to those of you joining us online at our Kesslinger campus and at our North Aurora campus. We're glad we're together to dig into God's Word. Recently, I saw a survey that was done about um, some of the religious markers in our culture today. And one of the shocking statistics was that a uh, number of church-going Americans that believe that the Bible is actually the literal Word of God has dropped to the lowest point in the last hundred years. I'm not sure what you think of that. But here at Chapel Street Church, we believe and are committed to the fact that this is the inspired Word of God. That the Word of God, the Bible, is living and active. That it's inspired by His Spirit, given through human authors, and passed down to us through the centuries that we have God's Word to us. It's authoritative over our lives. It reveals to us who we are and who He is, and that it's our authority for how we're supposed to live and act in the world. And so when we come to God's Word, that's what we're coming to. It's not good advice. It's not a, a philosophy to subscribe to. It's not you know, an ancient book that we just pick and choose from. It's God's Word to us and the authority over our lives. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us through His Word. Father, we pause now and acknowledge that your word is living and active and that you are present to us in it and revealed to us through it. And we ask you now to speak to our hearts, to reveal yourself to us through these, the, the pages of your word. Help us to hear and to obey, we pray in your name. Amen. Now, I hope this summer series called By Faith in Hebrews chapter 11 has been an encouragement and a blessing in your life. I hope that you're growing deeper in your trust and understanding of who God is and your desire to walk with him by faith. Uh, what greater ambition, really, could you have of your life than to be a man or woman who is growing in faith? We talk about that here, experience grace, grow in faith, and make an impact. What better goal could you have for your life than to be a man or woman who's growing in faith? That is, not just belief intellectually that God exists, but the knowledge of Him, trust in Him, and ability to walk with Him every day of your life. What better legacy could you leave to your children or grandchildren, should you have them, than to be a man or woman marked by a deep and abiding faith in God? That's at the heart of what we're trying to accomplish here, what we're all on the journey of growing in, in this series called By Faith. Hebrews 11, verse 1. We'll go back and review for just a minute. 11, 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Assurance and conviction. That is, faith is that there's a deep assurance. It's not blind faith. It's not faith in spite of evidence. It's an assurance and conviction of my soul that God is who he says he is in his word, that he can be trusted, and that he's guiding my life according to his word. So that's what we're after. I hope it's what you're after as well. I know that I've talked to many of you who are growing in your faith through this series. So we're going to dig in. Now, because it's not because of our faith. It's not because we're so faithful. It's because of who we place our faith in. That's one of the mistakes sometimes people make. They think it matters how much faith you have. Jesus says faith as small as a mustard seed can accomplish great things. What does he mean? He means it's the object of your faith, where your faith is placed, the one in whom you trust that matters more than the level of your faith. So even if you're new to this life of faith, what matters is that you know and trust God. He's the object of our faith, and he's the one revealed to us. So we've been looking at these heroes from Hebrews chapter 11 of the faith. And they are not perfect. They're not, uh, they're not perfect saints. They're deeply flawed individuals. But their lives were marked by a deep and abiding trust in God. So today is certainly one of the examples of people that have been marked by faith. Jacob is not, by any stretch, a perfect individual. Lots of flaws. Now, last week we looked at the part two of the Abraham saga. Jacob is the grandson of Abraham, the son of Isaac. Isaac's name means laughter. He's the son of laughter, as it were. And that's the title of a great book written by Frederick Buechner about Jacob's life. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 20 through 21. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. Those two verses, two sentences, bookend Jacob's life, blessed by his father Isaac and blessing his grandsons of, uh, through Joseph. There's a lot that happens in the Jacob saga in between those two verses. There's lots of material we could go to in the Old Testament. We're going to look at one central story, which I believe is the pinnacle, the turning point, of Jacob's life, why he's listed here for us as someone who lived by faith, what, what turned him into a hero of the faith, so to speak. Um, now, 
the writer of Hebrews doesn't give us much detail there. I think the writer of Hebrews is assuming his original readers knew the Jacob story. I don't want to make that assumption. Some of you, it might be uh, new to you. So we're going to give you a little background here on Jacob's story. There's a lot, and you could read about it in Genesis 27 through 35, uh, but we're going to look at just a few of the highlights. So Jacob is the younger of twin brothers, his older brother Esau, both born to Isaac and Isaac's uh, wife, Rebecca. Now, um, <laughs> or excuse me, Rachel, um, I, uh, Jacob is uh, smooth-skinned, Esau is hairy. Jacob is, likes the tents, or in, he's kind of indoorsy, he's a mama's boy. Esau is outdoorsy, and he's daddy's favorite. This is a little bit of a dysfunctional family. They play favorites in this family. And this produces uh, a character in Jacob's life that we see from, the, from birth. In fact, his very name means heel grabber, one who comes out of the womb grasping for his position and place in the world. And that marks his life right on through. In fact, he cheats his brother, tricks his brother out of his birthright. Esau wasn't all that bright. He traded his birthright for some bean stew. And he uh, deceives his father into giving him the blessing that was due to Esau. His father, Isaac, was old and blind at the time. And his mother, uh, Rebecca, helped him with that. Uh, so this, again, the family had some issues. Maybe that encourages you. If your family has issues, the people in the Bible didn't have perfect families either. So he has to flee from his brother Esau's wrath. He runs away because Esau is raging angry. He flees to a land called Padan Haran, where he meets with, up with his uncle Laban. And he, his uncle Laban is kind of a sly guy and also a, 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 a trickster. And they get into this sort of duel about uh, uh, flocks and herds and wealth. And uh, Jacob gets the upper hand with flocks and herds. Jacob comes out of this time with his uncle with two wives, many children, servants, multiple flocks and herds. He's a, a wealthy man. And it's been 20 years since he was face-to-face -face with his brother Esau. Now Jacob is a well-established, wealthy man with large family, many servants, uh, flocks and herds, as we said. And in Genesis 31, verse 13, God tells Jacob to go back to his homeland. He appears to him in a dream and calls and says, I want you to go back home to the land of your father. And, that, and Jacob does. Let's pick up the story in Genesis 32, verses 1 through 8. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's camp. So he called the name of that place Manahim. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants, female servants. I have sent to tell my lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. And the messenger returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you, and there are four hundred men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people who were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two camps, thinking, If Esau comes to one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. Okay, we'll pause there for a minute. It's been 20 years, and Esau is coming. And there are 400 men with him. And the implication is this is not the party planning committee. They're not coming to throw, welcome home, brother. We're having a big party. I brought all my friends. This is a terrifying thought. Esau and 400 presumably armed men are on their way to meet Jacob. Jacob's reaction in verse 7 is not surprising. It's great fear and distress. He's terrified about this. Not just for himself, but for all that are dependent on him. He's the leader of a clan now. Now, we're, we're going to see how Jacob responds, and we're going to see how, uh, how he prepares to meet his brother. And most importantly, we're going to see in Jacob's response three principles for how we encounter God. Jacob thinks he's preparing to meet his brother Esau, but actually he's preparing, though he doesn't know it, to come face to face with God. And that's what the whole story is about. And I want to examine these three crucial lessons or aspects of Jacob's encounter uh, as we jump into this Old Testament story, it's the heart of the Jacob saga. Uh, let's look at verses 22 through 31 of Genesis 32. We'll read this in its entirety. This is the story. That same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. 
He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. I'll tell you, this is my favorite Old Testament story. There are a lot of amazing stories. But for whatever reason, this story has always held a place in my heart. I think it speaks to my own journey and struggle and faith, and, and hopefully it will to you as well. Now, when Jacob sends his wives and his children and his flocks and herds across the river Jabbok ahead of him, it might be easy to think, what a coward. What a coward that he's sending them all ahead to face angry Esau and 400 men, and he doesn't go first himself. Let's not be too hasty. I think perhaps what Jacob is doing is thinking, reasoning it out and saying, if the first thing my brother sees is my face, that might likely enrage him, and it would be bad for all of us. Better he sees innocent children and flocks and herds as gifts to him and things that, that don't have to do with me necessarily, and then perhaps his anger will be assuaged and he could, we could meet and talk. I think that's probably what he's doing. But any, whatever the case, he sends ahead everything he has, crosses the river Jabbok. There's no bridges. They had to ford this river. It's dangerous at night. Then Jacob recrosses the river and stays on the other side by himself all alone. This is the first lesson in your encounter with God we learn from Jacob's life. You must meet God on your own. You must meet God on your own. Tomorrow for Jacob is the day of confrontation. But tonight, he's left alone. He's praying, preparing, seeking God, thinking through how he'll deal with Esau, worrying, maybe regretting. He's alone. Look at Genesis 32, verse 24 once more. We see right here, the text simply says, right before this encounter, and Jacob was left alone. There it is. That's not insignificant. Don't miss that. If you want to meet God, truly encounter God, then you must meet him on your own. You must learn to get alone. It's possible, you know, to get caught up in the moment and the movement and the energy of a community of faith. I see that at our church all the time. People are drawn to the activity, the outreach, and the energy of the place, and that's wonderful, and it's a good thing. But you cannot have a relationship with God purely through someone else or through a crowd. You must meet him on your own. N.T. Wright writes this, you can be overshadowed by God, surrounded by those who know God, and not be penetrated in your soul by him. Of course people can help us in our faith journey. Of course we need community. And of course people can encourage you and bless you and point you to God. Of course that happens. The Bible's full of stories of that. That's why we're studying Hebrews 11. But, Ultimately speaking, those other people cannot live your life of faith. You must. Each of us must come to meet God on our own. Swiss uh, physician Paul Tournier writes, Every great and defining moment in the life of, of each of us we must face alone. Here's what he means. If somebody's facing cancer or a, an oper a life-saving operation, we say things like, you're not going through this alone. You're not alone. And to a degree, that's true. But ultimately... They don't wheel you and your whole family and your friends back into the operating room. You go alone. Just you. That's what he means. There are moments that God meets us when we need to be alone. And in our world today, I think it's increasingly hard to get alone. We've got ear pods in all the time, screens right in front of us, always with the crowd, social media. We're never alone. We might be by ourselves, but we're not truly alone. I, and I'll just say again, Friends, if you want to encounter God, you've got to learn to get alone. To experience his transformational power in your life. Get alone with his word. 
and worship, cry out to him, pour out your heart to him, and meet, he'll meet you there. That's what happens here in the life of Jacob. So the second lesson from the Jacob encounter with God is that you must meet God in your weakness. We'll take some time on this one. Let me ask you a question. Why is Jacob alone beside the river Jabbok? Why is he even there? Why did he pack up all of his family and belongings and head there anyway? Why didn't he just stay where he was? Why doesn't he turn around when he hears Esau's coming and go somewhere else? Why is he there? He's there because in Genesis 31 verse 13, God told him to be there. He's doing what God told him to do. Now, Jacob's life has been marked by this, as I said, this struggle to achieve, to accomplish, to grasp his own place in the world, yet he's also been growing spiritually. He's had encounters with God. He's a prayerful man. He's an obedient man, not a perfect man. But how would you expect, based on your knowledge of who God is, how would you expect God to treat a humble, prayerful, and obedient man in this moment? How would you want God to treat you? If you're seeking him on the night before a crisis or a big confrontation, when you're crying out to him, asking for something from him, what would you think God would do? How would you expect God to react? To bless him? To comfort him? To encourage him? To give him some strength and wisdom? What, God, what does God do? I mean, how does God respond? He clobbers him. He comes to him and wrestles him and wounds him permanently. What, what kind of God is this? What kind of God is it that when a man is alone crying out to him, comes and wrestles with him and permanently gives him a limp? This, this is not the God of human invention, friends. This is not the God the writers of the Bible made up out of their own heads. Who would invent a God like this? How are you to understand this God? This is not the God of the liberal progressive movement today which just, who just accepts everyone indiscriminately and doesn't, it doesn't matter. He just loves everybody no matter what you do or how you live. Neither is this the God of the far-right fundamentalist who only blesses those who follow all the rules and vote the right way. This is a different God altogether. This is a different kind of God. This is a God of terror and tenderness, of warmth and of wrath. C.S. Lewis in his uh, great story, The Chronicles of Narnia, he's speaking to Lucy when she first hears uh, Mr. Beaver, that is, one of the characters, is speaking to Lucy, one of the Pevensey children, when she first hears about Aslan, the Christ figure, a great lion, and she hears from Mr. Beaver that Aslan is a lion. She's terrified. She says, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver says, safe? Who said anything about safe? Oh, no, he's not safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. I've always loved that line. He's not like a tame lion. He's not safe, but he is good. And there's a difference. We want a safe, tame God who's predictable, does what we want him to do, meets our needs, blesses us on our terms. That is not the God of the Bible. That is not the God Jake, Jacob met that night beside the river Jabbok. And it's not the God, ultimately, that you need in your life. Here's one of the primary truths of this story is this. In general... God has to wrestle us into a transformed life. It takes struggle. Generally speaking, and I don't, this is true for me, I don't know if it's true for you, I presume it is, I do not drift naturally into becoming a more obedient, humble, peaceful, kind, generous, and selfless man. That's hard work. Sometimes I resist it. Sometimes God has to wrestle me into that kind of transformation. And I wrestle back with him. Maybe you can relate to that. You have to wonder, what was this all-night wrestling match with God like? The text doesn't say it's God. We find that out later when Jacob realizes, but it is a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Christ, the second person of the Trinity wrestling with God at night by the river. Uh, Frederick Buechner, in his book, The Son of Laughter, writes this about the encounter. I'm going to read an excerpt for you. Out of the dark, someone leaped at me with such force that it knocked me onto my back. It was a man, but I could not see his face. I did not know who it was. I did not know who I was. I knew only my terror and that it was as dark as death. I knew only that what the stranger seemed to want was my life. For the rest of the night, we battled in the reeds with the Jabbok River roaring down through the gorge above us. Every time that I thought I was lost, I escaped somehow. There were moments when I seemed to be prevailing. It was as if he was letting me prevail. Then he was at me with new fury. 
but he did not prevail. For hours it went on this way. We could not see each other. We spoke no words. I did not know why we were fighting. It was like fighting in a dream. He outweighed me. He outwrestled me. But somehow he did not overpower me. He did not overpower me until the moment came to overpower me. When that moment came, I knew that he could have made it come whenever he wanted. I knew that all of the night he'd been waiting for that moment. Now, I, I think about this a lot. I wrestled in high school and in college, and, and I don't mean WWE fake wrestling. I mean real wrestling. <laughs> and uh, a nine-minute match in college is exhausting. Heavyweight wrestling, there's a lot of leaning and panting and sweating, not a lot of activity. But nevertheless, it's tiring. I can't imagine wrestling all night with someone to an apparent draw. What's happening here? When does Jacob realize what it is that, or who it is that he's been wrestling with? He doesn't know at first. Just, a, just as a man came out of the dark and wrestled with him, attacked him. There's a turning point in the story, verses 25 through 26. When the man, this is God, saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. He just touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Think about that for just a minute. They've wrestled all night to an apparent draw. After hours of struggle, he just touches Jacob's hip socket. Just, just a touch. I don't know about you, but I cannot help thinking about uh, a silly movie uh, called Kung Fu Panda well, when, the, when the whooshy finger hold. Skadoosh, right? Or the pinky. Just, just one little touch and boom, Jacob is he's crippled. He's undone. He's in excruciating pain. Uh, the, the, dislocating a hip is one of the worst kinds of pain you can experience. Just the touch and Jacob realizes he's been toying with me. I've had no chance. He's, this, he could have done this at any moment. That's when things change for Jacob. Here's the point. The change comes at the moment of Jacob's weakness. When he realizes, I, I'm overpowered, I'm outmatched, I have no chance, that's when the change begins to happen, uh, in his, not just in the story, but in his whole life. C.S. Lewis, again, in his book, The Problem of Pain, writes a famous line. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasures. But he shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. That's been true in my life. The most transformational moments in my own faith journey, perhaps yours as well, have not been the most comfortable ones. They've been the hard moments, the moments of pain and struggle. That's how God works. Notice in verse 26, Jacob is no longer trying to win. He's clinging but it's not to pin his opponent, not to win, not to conquer. Now he's holding on for a different reason. He's clinging to God for the blessing. Look what he says. Then he said, let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Prior to this, Jacob is looking for a blessing. He's looking to win. He's looking to conquer. He's looking to have his way. When his hip is wrenched in his weakness, he realizes this is no ordinary opponent. I have no chance, but he won't let go. He's clinging on for a different reason. You see, Jacob's life has been defined up to this point by his struggle, his clutching, his grasping to get ahead in life, to have his way. And that's really, I think, the problem behind all of Jacob's problems. His struggles with himself and with God. It's not with Esau. It's not with his father. It's not with his uncle. Though he thinks that's the case. He's learning that the secret to a life of faith is not to be the smartest, the toughest, the most clever, the most shrewd. It's to be the one who clings to God and says, I will not let go. Even though I can't even walk, I won't let go unless you bless me. I hold on desperately for the blessing. Let me jump back to Frederick Buechner's story and read to you how Jacob describes that moment. I knew that through the night he'd been waiting for that moment and he could have done it any time. I knew I was crippled and done for. I could do nothing but cling now. I clung for dear life. I clung for dear death. My arms trust him. My legs locked him. For the first time he spoke and he said, let me go. 
His words were more breath than sound. He said, let me go for the day is breaking, and only then did I see it, the first faint shudder of light behind the farthest hills. And I said, I will not let go. I cl it was my life that I clung to. My enemy was my life. I said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Even if his blessing meant my death, I wanted it more than my life. So when Jacob says that he won't let go unless God blesses him, it's as if he's realizing something in that moment. Let's go back to Jacob as a young man. Longing for the approval of his father. Longing to have the words, the blessing of a father spoken over him. And willing to do deceitful and, and despicable things to get it. That deeply marked him and wounded him. His whole life was characterized by this, this insatiable need for approval and for achievement and for conquest that he's going to get in his own strength. And here in this moment, clinging to God at night by the river Jabbok, it's as if Jacob's realizing something, that the beauty he was seeking in Rachel, his wife, was actually God. That God was the wealth that he sought from his uncle Laban. That it was God he was seeking when he was struggling uh, with Esau over the birthright and privilege and status in the family. And that fundamentally, it was God who was the approval he sought from his father Isaac. All those things, right? Beauty and wealth and status and approval, he's been grasping for. And now he realizes, I can only have them by holding on for dear life to this one who wounded me. That's what's happening here in this moment for him. And in that way, this story is a profound metaphor for every person who wants to encounter God. You must come to meet him alone. And you must come to meet him at your point of weakness. Up to this point, Jacob's been perhaps viewed, viewing God as a means to his end. A way to get what he wants in life. I know many, many Christians in America today view God that way. Sprinkle a little religion, a little God, a little spirituality over my life, and he'll help me get what I want in my job, with my family. You know, it's good to have God's blessing. <laughs> I remember years ago talking to a young man I was coaching at football who said, it's good to have the big guy on our side, as if by saying some magic words, God is going to bless the game. God is not a means to our end. God is the end. He's the whole goal. And Jacob, in this moment, with a dislocated hip, has finally realized it. This is the blessing. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 through 10. But he said to me, this is Jesus speaking to him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul is experiencing what he calls a thorn in his flesh, some, something that was troubling him greatly, physically, spiritually, mentally, we're not sure. He's begging with God to take it away, and God says, no, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is going to make, be made perfect, that is, on display in your weakness. That's exactly what's happening to Jacob. Friends, you and I will never know the true power and grace and mercy of God if we're always doing everything in our own strength. Until you come to the end of your strength, you will not know the strength of God. And that is what God, in his mercy, is wrestling with Jacob to bring about. This brings us to the final lesson of Jacob's encounter with God. You must meet God in his weakness. Okay, now I know. Some of you are reading that going, wait, wait, wait. That's got to be a misprint. What are you talking about? How can God be weak? Isn't God omnipotent? Doesn't he have all strength? Isn't he almighty? Did he just touch his socket and it's wrenched out of place? I mean... What do you mean God's weakness? Well, hang with me. Look again at Genesis 32, verse 25. When the man, this by the way is God, saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. What does that mean? When God realized that he wasn't going to win, that he could not prevail, that he what is it talking about? How is it possible that God could not prevail against Jacob? Isn't he almighty? Let me use an analogy from my, I have two sons, Noah and Benjamin. They're grown now. They're, they're 22 and 25, uh, 26, excuse me. Forgive me, Noah, if you're watching. 
when we would wrestle when they were kids, uh, you know, as, as the, they're little guys, I would not do this now. It would be bad for me. They're too, too strong and too big. But when they were little and we would wrestle, I, I wanted them to feel like they're doing well. So we'd wrestle on the floor, and I'd pin them down for a while, then let them up, and I'd let them pin me, and I'd let them take me down. And Benjamin developed this move called the double knee drop. He would jump off the couch, tuck his feet behind him, and drive his bony knees into the small of my back when I wasn't looking. <laughs> it was very painful. But the point is I would let them do these things to me because I wanted them to have fun and feel like they were winning. But I withheld my full strength and weight. Why? Because th as little boys, they could not bear the full weight of the father. I would crush them. I was too big and strong for them. It would, so I held back, in other words. But every now and then, just to let them know, I'd pin them down, right, and hold them down there. In a sense, God is withholding the full weight of who he is to engage with Jacob. He, he, he can't come, and Jacob couldn't bear the full weight of the Almighty God. It would obliterate him. Just a touch dislocates his hip. So what does God do? God, in a sense, makes himself weak to encounter, to engage with, to struggle with this man who desperately needs it. And God still does that today. He does it with me. He does it with you. How good and merciful and personal and gracious is God that he would withhold his strength, make himself weak in order to wrestle with us for our good, that we would get the blessing. In a sense, God lost in order to win, to win Jacob. And he does this still today. Now, where is the ultimate place in the story of the Bible where God lost in order to win? Where is the place that you would go to to say, this is the pinnacle of God making himself weak? I'm, I'm guessing you already know. It's the cross. The place where Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Here's how Paul puts it in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. That's the Greek word kenosis. It means he essentially emptied, poured out, weakened himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and become, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. God in Christ makes himself weak and goes to the cross. He loses, dying, in order to win. He would not let go. Remember in the garden, what does Jesus pray? This is the great wrestling match that Jesus had with the Father. If there's any other way, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. He wrestled with God. He went willingly to the cross. He clung to the cross. Why? So that you and I would get the blessing. You see what this crazy, strange story in Genesis 32 is pointing us to? A God who is willing to make himself weak to wrestle with us, who will contend with us, who will go all the way to the cross for us and cling to it so that we would get the blessing if we will cling to him even in our weakness. Now, last, what was the blessing Jacob received? What is the blessing that God gives Jacob? He's, he's begging for a blessing. Well, two things. He gets a new name and he gets a limp. <laughs> How are those blessings? They're profound blessings if we understand what they mean. His new name, listen, 28 through 29. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Remember, Jacob means heel grabber, usurper. Israel means you have striven with God, with men have prevailed. Israel means one who struggles with God. Israel becomes the name of God's people, the tribes of Israel, the people of Israel. The Israelites, the people who wrestle with God and wrestling not to win or to conquer him, but wrestling to surrender to him, struggling to cling to him for the blessing. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it you ask my name? And there he blessed him. Now in the Old Testament, blessings are always verbal. They're always spoken because words have power. Jacob wants the blessing from his father, Isaac, and he gets it. It's a spoken blessing. All we get in the text is that God blessed him. We don't know what he said, but he had to have said something. I think it's because it was just for Jacob. It was the words 
frankly, I get emotional thinking about this. It was the words Jacob in his soul longed to hear all his life that he was trying to get from his father, from his wife, from his uncle, from his success, from his brother, from achievement in life. Many of you, and I'm doing the same thing at times, are trying to find that blessing, that word of approval in some other way. It doesn't come that way. I think when it says that he blessed him, I think God in the dark, after having wounded him, leans down and whispers into his ear exactly what Jacob's soul needed to hear. And he'll do the same thing for you. I love you, my daughter. You're precious to me. You're beautiful in my sight. You're worthy. Everything that we need to hear. I remember talking to a good friend of mine who's a counselor and therapist, and he said every one of us has a core question we're asking at the soul level that only the gospel can answer. Am I loved? Am I valuable? Am I safe? That's the blessing. And God wants to whisper that to you, just for you, your own blessing. So, fundamentally, what does this mean? We win with God by losing. We win with God by surrendering, by clinging to him in, in desperation. Not by conquest, not by power, not by strength, not by achievement, but by full surrender. Last little bit here as the story concludes, verses 30 through 31. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered, meaning spared. Because in the Old Testament, you could not look on God in his face and, and, and live. Yet Jacob says, I've seen him. I've seen a glimpse of him as we wrestled that night. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Jacob limped the rest of his life. The rest of Jacob's life, he ambled with a funny limp because of that wrestling match that night. And here's the beautiful thing. That limp becomes the marker of his blessing. Sometimes God has to wound us in order to bless us. Sometimes God has to scar us in order to heal us. We, we serve a Savior who has scars. He himself was wounded, pierced for our transgressions, wounded for our iniquities. So if in your life you've been through hard things, painful things, and you feel like you walk with a bit of a spiritual or emotional limp, take heart that God can take that pain, redeem it, and use it. And even though you limp in this life, it's a mark of his grace and blessing on you. In fact, the people that I know that are closest to God limp a little. They've been through some things. They've been wounded because they've been in the wrestling match with a God who loves them and wants to bless them. Friends, I don't know all of you watching and hearing this. Some of you are contending with God right now. You're struggling and striving over some issue in your life. You're trying to win. You're trying to wrestle him down. You're trying to wrestle with yourself. Learn from the life of Jacob. God loves you enough to make himself weak to wrestle with you. But he wants to bless you. And that blessing can only come when you come to the point of your weakness and surrender. And he loves you enough to even wound you to do it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word, that you're present in it. We thank you for this ancient story which points us to the cross, the place where you made yourself weak. You clung to the cross so that we might receive a blessing we can get no other way. Thank you that, as Peter told us, you alone have the words of life. Teach us to cling to you, because that is what it means to live by faith. We pray in your name. Amen.